Hello and welcome to the Metaphysical Emporium. I'm Marcus Adair, and this is the sixth part of the series that I'm calling The Road to Modern Witchcraft. We covered parts one through five in separate videos, all of which are still available on YouTube. In the fifth part of The Road to Modern Witchcraft, we talked about Robert Graves, English Parliament Witchcraft Acts, Doreen Valiente, Arnold and Patricia Crowther. If you have not checked out those videos, please do so. As always, you can post any questions in the comments or email questions as well. Please subscribe to the channel and like the video. It helps me out a great deal. Also, the Metaphysical Emporium has a Twitter page as well as a Facebook page, so please check out those as well. Before we begin, I'm going to apologize in advance for any mispronunciations. Let's talk about Eleanor Bone. Ele uh, born Eleanor Raybone on December 15, 1911, she had an uneventful childhood. Bone began to question her Christian faith when the local victor, vicar told her animals did not go to heaven. How insane is that? A vicar telling a child that animals do have no soul. Uh, Bone's craft name was Artemis. Bone was an influential figure in Wicca. In 1939, at the start of World War II, Bone went to work in Cumbria in the north of England. Bone claimed to be initiated in 1941 into witchcraft by a couple of hereditary witches in Cumbria. Bone came under the care of an elderly couple in Cumbria. They revealed themselves to be hereditary witches. Uh, she spent four years practicing and learning from them. Bone returned to London in 1945 at the end of the war and married her husband, Bill. By day, Bone worked as a matron in a home for the elderly, and at night she ran a witch's coven. In the mid-1950s, she became friends with Gerald Gardner, becoming a high priestess of one of his covens. 1960, Bone rose to become high priestess of her own Gardnerian coven in Toothingbeck, London. Several early initiates of this coven would become very prominent leaders of the craft. Bone was less at ease with publicity, but would pose for photographers and give interviews to authors, journalists, and researchers. Bone uh, invited a newspaper photographer to photo parts of a secret skyclad or nude initiation ceremony held in a remote cottage deep in Lockwood, Hetteshord Fur. And I'm going to go ahead and put that spelling up on the screen. <clears throat> Bone was regarded by some as the matron of British witchcraft, or matriarch. In May of 1966, both Bone and Patricia Crowther, we talked about Patricia Crowther in the previous part of this series, combined forces to denounce Alex Sanders. They accused Sanders of having an invalid initiation. They both rebuked his claim uh, to the title King of the Witches. Both also refuted his claim of being, hered uh, being a hereditary witch. In response, Saunders created Alexandrian Wicca. And I'm going to talk about Sanders in an upcoming part of this series. In 1968, Bone was instrumental in moving Gardner's remains to a more fitting place close to the ancient city of Carthage. In 1972, Bone retired to a small village in Alliston in Cumbria. However, she did continue in her role as spokesperson and apologist for witchcraft. Bone wrote no books that I can find. However, I did find a video on YouTube, and I'm going to go ahead and put that uh, link up on the screen so that you can check out that video. All right, that's all we have on Bone. Let's talk about the modern witchcraft tradition known as Fairy, F-E-R-I. I'm going to go ahead and put that up on the screen. Fairy is a initiatory tradition of modern pagan witchcraft. Fairy was founded in California in the 60s by Victor Henry Anderson and his wife, Cora Anderson. Practitioners have described the fairy tradition as an ecstatic tradition rather than a fertility tradition. 
Ecstasy from the Greek word meaning outside of oneself, a subjective experience. In Greek literature, it refers to the mind or body from its normal place or function, which makes me think of out-of-body experiences. In the fairy tradition, there is a strong emphasis uh, placed on sensual experience and awareness, including sexual mysticism, which is not limited to a heterosexual expression. The fairy tradition consists of diverse influences such as Huna, Voodoo, Fairy Lore, the Kabbalah, Hoodoo, Tantra, and Gnosticism. In 1944, Victor Henry Anderson met Cora Ann. They were married three days later and claimed that they had encountered each other before on the astral plane. Cora had uh, been exposed to folk magic practices from childhood. Supposedly, her Irish grandfather was a root doctor who was known among locals as a druid. As a teen, Victor was exposed to voodoo by a group of Haitians who were working in southern Oregon. The Andersons claimed that one of their first acts after marriage was to erect an altar. Cora would also claim that their son's name came to her in a dream. In 1948, a ritual was held to dedicate the infant to the goddess. The Andersons became members of the Alameda Lodge of the Fraternal Order of Eagles and would remain so for 40 years. Supposedly, the Andersons could speak Hawaiian, Spanish, Creole, Greek, Italian, and Gothic languages. In 1926, an old African priestess introduced Victor Anderson to witchcraft. This priestess supposedly practiced a form of witchcraft with Huna and African influences that were primarily... Uh, Haitian, and I'm going to go ahead and put those spellings up on the screen. Another account of Victor being initiated as a witch involves a woman of the fairy race. An account of this can be found in Margaret Adler's book, Drawing Down the Moon. I think it is important to note that the Andersons made a lot of fantastical claims. Not long after Victor's initiation, Victor was introduced to the Harpy Coven, a pre gardenerian group in Southern Oregon. The coven included Victor in their rituals. The coven disbanded around the start of World War II. Mid-1950s, Victor and Cora read Witchcraft Today, the 1954, of course, book by Gerald Gardner. Cora claimed that Victor corresponded with Gardner for a time. Chaz Clifton, a pagan studies scholar, has suggested that the Andersons use Gardner's work as a style guide to develop their own tradition of modern pagan witchcraft. Here again, we see taking what came before and repurposing it. Cora was a natural psychic and an authentic kitchen witch. Cora was the author, I'm um, sorry, was an author and poet in her own right. Circa 1960s, the Andersons founded a coven. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and put that name up on the screen. I don't want to mispronounce it. Um, this name was after the Hawaiian word for full moon. 1950s to early 1960s, the Andersons initiated several individuals into the coven. Around 1959, Anderson's son brought home a school friend named Tom DeLong, who would eventually be known to the world as Gwendon Penderween. Penderween contributed to the development of what came to be known as the fairy tradition. Penderween was heavily influenced by wealth mythology. Penderween, on a visit to Britain, spent time with Alexandrian Wiccans, Alexanders, and Stuart Farr, thus adding Alexandrian elements to the fairy tradition. Celtic influences would also be added later. Today, the tradition has evolved and contains a mixture of Green Wicca, Celtic, and Druidic practices. Penderween was instrumental in helping the Anders Andersons publish Victor's first book of poetry, Thorns of the Blood Rose, in 1970. The historical origins of fairy have long been debated, and it's doubtful a single account will ever be accepted by all. The fairy tradition was influenced by a variety of indigenous folk magical traditions, Fairy witchcraft emphasizes bardic, shamanistic, and ecstatic practices. It also celebrates the embodiment and human sexuality in all consensual forms. Keyword there, consensual. 
Super important note here that when dealing with any sort of sexual magic, there must always be consent. Full disclosure, just consent. Fairy witchcraft is considered to be queer, not just because of its embrace of alternative sexualities, but because of its fundamental orientation towards otherness and the uncanny. Victor Anderson sometimes referred to fairy as a devotional science. Victor Ada Anderson also claimed that fairy was first practiced by a small, dark-skinned people who came out of Africa tens of thousands of years ago. Victor Anderson said he considered fairy a good name for the tradition because it included nature spirits, gods, and the ancestral race of small humans. The fairy tradition honors the goddess and her son, brother, and lover as a primary creative forces in the universe. In the fairy tradition, gods are seen as real spirit beings like ourselves. Victor taught each student differently according to what he felt the student needed and often according to the student's ethnic background. And I raise an eyebrow at that. It's definitely some questions that need to be reviewed there. This concept has been carried forward. Individual practitioners often have surprisingly different beliefs and practices. Although a few core practices and pieces of the fairy tradition were widely shared, Victor resisted being called the founder of the tradition, preferring to consider himself as the grandmaster of an existing faith. The fairy tradition name has been spelled in a variety of ways, and I'm going to go ahead and put those up on the screen so you can see them. Vicka was also an early name for the tradition. 1990s, Victor adopted the spelling F-E-R-I to help differentiate the tradition from others using the word fairy, F-A-E-R-Y. The change was not universally adopted, and some lines still use other spellings. Currently, many thousands are estimated per, to practice the neo-fairy traditions. Uh, some recommended reading, 50 Years in the Fairy Tradition by Cora Anderson, a great book if you want to understand more about the fairy tradition. Let's talk about Lois Bourne. She was born on April 10th, 1928. Her craft name was Tanith. She was an influential figure in Wicca. She was initiated, of course, by Gerald Gardner. She was the high priestess of the Brecket Wood Coven, the first Wiccan coven started by Gerald Gardner. She wrote a book in 1979, Witch Among Us, an, autobi an autobiography of a witch. Over the course of her life, she branched out from Gardnerian Wicca and learned ceremonial magic, Santriara, voodoo, Obeith and Eastern mysticism. She was particularly interested in jinns or genies. Um, in Arabic mythology, jinns are spirits inhabiting the earth but unseen by humans, capable of assuming various forms and exercising extraordinary powers. Belief in jinn was common in pre Islamic. Arabia, where the, uh, the, they were thought to inspire poets and soothsayers. Their existence was affirmed in the Quran, and they are conceptual in Islam as creatures parallel to human beings who are capable of choosing between good and evil, and must thus face eventual salvation or damnation. They are beings of smokeless flame by nature, in the same manner in which humans are said to be made of the earth, they cannot be seen by human beings. All right, that's all we have on Lois Bourne. I highly recommend further, further reading, especially on the subject of the jinn. Let's talk about Robert Cochran. His real name was Roy Bowers. Cochran came from a working class family in West London. Cochran became interested in occultism after attending a society for a psychological research lecture. Cochran claimed to have been born to a hereditary family of witches that stretched back to the 17th century. 
He also claimed two family members in the past had been executed as witches. Cochran also claimed that his great-grandfather had been the last grandmaster of the Stratfordshire witches. Cochran stated that his grandparents had abandoned the craft and converted to Methodism, causing his great-grandfather to curse them. His father claimed, uh, I'm sorry, he further claimed that his father practiced witchcraft in secret. His mother was made to keep the secret, but revealed the secret to Robert after the death of his father. Cochran asserted that his Aunt Lucy actually taught him about the craft. All of these claims would be dismissed, and these claims were even dismissed by members of his own family. In the early 1960s, Cochran founded his second coven, which would provide the basis for the clan of Tubal Cain. He placed an investment in the Manchester Guardian looking for members. In the advert, Cochran requested that anyone interested in Robert Graves, the White Goddess, contact him. Um, this seems unusual, but I think that was a common practice for the time. A few details about Cochran's craft. The clan of Tubal Cain was named after the legendary Hebrew smith Tubal Cain. The clan of Tubal Cain revered a horn god and fate expressed as the pale faced goddess named Hecate or Hecate. The goddess was viewed as the white goddess, a term taken from Robert Graves' book of the same name. The god was associated with fire, the underworld, and time, and described as the goat god of fire, lower magics, fertility, and death. The god was known by several names, most notably Tubal Cain, Brain, Wayland, and Hearn. Cochrane's tradition held that these two deities had a son, the Horn Child, who was a young sun follower. I'm sorry, a young sun god. Followers wore black robes. The coven used five main tools, the ritual knife, a staff known as a stang, a cup, a stone, a ritual cord worn by coven members. They never used a book of shadows and they operated spontaneously and shamanistically. November of 1963, Cochran published an article titled Genuine Witchcraft is Defended in Psychic News. The article caused Cochran to gain public prominence. The article outlined his beliefs regarding witchcraft and was Cochran's first claim that he came from a hereditary line of witches. Cochran took a hostile attitude towards the Gardnerian tradition of Wicca, deeming Gardner a con man and a sexual deviant. Coined the term, um, Cochran coined the term Gardnerian for the practicers of Gardnerian witchcraft. Pagan studies scholar Ethan Doyle has identified four possible reasons for Cochran's dislike of Gardnerians and Gardnerian witchcraft. Cochran disliked public publicity seeking. Cochran disliked Gardnerians' focus on ritual, liturgy, and magic. Cochran was jealous of the success of Gardner. Cochran may have been hostile due to a bad past experience with Gardnerian witchcraft and Gardnerianism, all of which seemed to be likely and reasonable. In 1964, Cochran met Doreen Valiente through mutual friends at a gathering at Glastonbury Tor. Valiente joined the clan of Tubal Cain. In Valiente's memoir, The Rebirth of Witchcraft, she describes Cochran as a charming and powerful rogue. Valiente liked uh, how, the Tubal, how the clan of Tubal Cain got close to nature, something not really done in gardening craft. Valiente liked how Cochran did not seem to want publicity. Valiente disliked how Cochran often insulted and mocked Gardnerian witches. In 1966, Cochran called for a Knight of the Long Knives of the Gardnerians. Valiente rose up and challenged Cochran in front of the entire coven. Valiente left the coven and never returned. After Valiente left Cochran, he continued to commit adultery and did not care that his wife knew. 
1965 to 66, December to April, Cochran corresponded with an American witch known as Joseph Bearwalker Wilson. Joseph is an individual that will be talked about in another part of this series. Cochran tried to commit suicide on Midsummer 1966, went into a coma, and died nine days later. Cochran did not write any books, but Cochran's letters served as a guidepost to witches. The Cochran, the Robert Cochran Letters, an insight into modern traditional witchcraft, a book, gives a good, good insight into Cochran. Let's talk about the Witchcraft Research Association, which was formed in 64. It was a British organization. It attempted to unite and study the various claims that had emerged of the surviving remnants of the witch cult. Uh, these claims were made by individuals like Robert uh, Cochran, Gerald Gardner, Sybil Leake, Charles Cardwell, and Raymond Howard. I think what the original purpose of the Witchcraft Research Association was, was to get a cohesive story and not the multiple branches of traditions that we have in Wicca today. The Research Association was set up by Gerald Knoll with the help of several other interested witches. The first president was Sybil Leake. The second president was Doreen Valiente. The Research Association published a magazine entitled uh, The Pentagram. The first issue was in August of 1964. Historian Ronald Hutton suggested two events for the formation of the Witchcraft Research Association, and that, of course, was the death of Gerald Gardner, and a lecture tour by historian Russell Hope Bobbins, who publicly criticized the Margaret Murray witchcraft, witch cult hypothesis, as we talked about in a previous edition of this series, Margaret Murray's research and theories were found to be inaccurate as she had manipulated the, uh, the data to her favor. Sybil Leake ran into some controversy and her reputation was damaged by press hostility. Leake also had a stained relationship with other witches. This all resulted in Leake's resignation from the Witchcraft Research Association and her emigration to the U.S., and then Valiente taking over as president of the Witchcraft Research Association. October 3rd of 1964, the Witchcraft Research Association hosted a dinner at which Valiente urged all witch traditions to come out of secrecy and join together. The 1960s were a period of revolution, things were changing, attitudes were changing, and it was a time for Wicca uh, to be free and world known. Valiente wrote in an article for Pentagram Magazine that her dream was to see the Witchcraft Research Association become the United Nation for witches. Pentagram Magazine would become um, a battle between Gardnerian and anti-Gardnerian witchcraft. By 66, Pentagram Magazine folded and the Witchcraft Research Association ceases soon after that. Let's talk about Sybil Leake. She was born on February 22nd of 1917. Leake was an English witch, astrologer, occult author, self-proclaimed psychic. She claimed to be born with a witch's mark. Leake was one of the first modern witches to take up environmental causes. Leake demonstrated an early gift for writing. She was dubbed Britain's most famous witch by the BBC. Leek had several trademarks and was indeed a very colorful character. She wore a cape. She wore loose gowns. She had a pet jackdaw named Mr. Hootfoot perched on her shoulder at all times. She wore a crystal necklace that she had claimed had been passed down to her from her psychic Russian grandmother. Leek's family was very involved in her education in witchcraft. The family was also very involved in astrology. Leek learned several things from her father. She claimed to be able to trace her father's ancestry to occultists close to the royalty in Tsarist Russia. 
She learned about nature from her father, animals, the power of herbs, and Eastern philosophies. Lee claimed to be able to trace her mother's ancestors back to the witches of Southern Ireland in 1134. Uh, she also learned several things from her Russian grandmother, including astrology, the psychic arts, and divination. Leek had little or uh, orthodox schooling, but seemed to have a very robust esoteric education from her family. Many scholar, scholarly characters visited the family home, including H.G. Wells, Lawrence of Arabia, and Alistair, Alistair Crowley. This exposure to individuals with a vast amount of knowledge had to have helped Leek uh, and shaped her in a variety of ways. Lee came from a middle-class family and claimed to have been descended from the historical witch Molly Lee. Molly Lee was an English property owner in Stratfire town of Burslem, who in her will left substantial sums to charity. She also was accused of witchcraft and after her death her grave was disturbed. Following claims that this uh, Molly was haunting the town. At age 16, Leek married her music teacher, though he died two years later. Her music teacher was 24 years her senior, which seems like a gross imbalance of power. Shortly after her husband died, Leek was sent to a French coven by her grandmother. Leek also claimed to have spent time with the New Forest Gypsies, learning from the Gypsies about the forest, ancient folklore, and practical use of herbs. During this time, Leek also attended rituals of the Horsa Coven. Horsa seems to be a particular type of witchcraft group and tradition. The Horsa Coven claimed to have existed for over 700 years. During World War II, Leek joined the Red Cross and worked as a nurse in a military hospital near Southampton. In April of 1964, Leek was invited to speak about her book, a shop in the High Street where she met Hans Holzer, a parapsychologist who invited her to join him in investigating hauntings and psychic phenomena. Hans Holzer was a paranormal investigator and researcher. I highly recommend the show, The Holzer Files. I'll go ahead and put a link um, up if I can find one so you can check that out. Leek went on to do numerous TV and radio programs. Leek was uh, in strong defense of her beliefs. Leek differed and even quarreled with other witches. She disapproved of nudity and rituals. She was strongly against the use of drugs. <clears throat> she also strongly believed in cursing. She claimed to have out-of-body experiences. Christian Jones, a student of Leek, stated that uh, Leek mixed truths with untruths liberally, causing great harm as she went. Leek published numerous books from 62 to 77, most still available online. Topics ranged from uh, astrology, numerology, and reincarnation. Leek wrote and spoke a great deal about reincarnation, guided, she said, by the spirit of Madame Helen Bolansky. All right, that's all we have for this episode. As always, I recommend doing your own reading and research. Any comments or questions, please send them my way via Facebook, Twitter, or drop an email. If I missed any important individuals, um, especially individuals important to modern witchcraft, send those names my way as well. Next month, we'll have another episode of The Road to Modern Witchcraft. Stay safe and stay enchanted.